Welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so I'm Eric uh, on Discord. I used to be JTech. I've rebranded. You know, there's a whole new JTech now. I got well, no lawyers involved. I wasn't getting sued by JTech, the company. I think it was just a little bit too much close to home. So now I'm Cal on Discord uh, and I'll update the other sources uh, soon enough. Uh, but uh, we'll do quick introductions. We're going to do that before or we're going to do it after? Do it with projects. Do it with projects at the end. Cool. So we'll do at the end of the talk, we'll have a, a space for folks to be able to cover individual projects, anything that you want to highlight, if there's anything uh, going on in the sense. I know we have uh, Carolina Code Con, so we might have Bright Ball on oh, in the back there. So, welcome. Awesome. Welcome, man. Uh, so we'll be able to kind of go over those and be able to, to kind of highlight things or events like Carolina Code Con. Uh, so our main code of conduct is, and this is part of DEFCON 864, just don't be rude, respect the privacy of others. We don't condone any illegal activities. We have, have had folks join in like the Discord server asking for random things like hacking an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend's Facebook account. We don't condone anything like that. Um, academic professional dishonesty is prohibited. Uh, we, we like to act ethically uh, and enjoy doing the things that the, the red teamers uh, get paid to do. Law enforcement encouraged, let's just be honest, and persons with disruptive or hazardous behavior will be banned and not welcome back. Outside of that, we welcome everyone. So if you want to continue education credits or CPEs, uh, we keep all of our meetings and everything else. The main thing that I do is I use Meetup. Uh, so with Meetup, that gives you that formal record. If you're using that system, then it has your attendance. And like with, say, ISC Squared, upload that as a part of claiming your CPE. So if you want to get credit, uh, we're not formally endorsed by ISC Squared because they want something like 20 grand uh, to be able to support something like that. And we don't have that kind of funds. Uh, but you can get CPEs and they do acknowledge them. Next, uh, on our website, which is dc864.org, uh, we do have resources available to you. Uh, we always have our meeting schedule available. We have our career notes uh, summarized, which has been a conglomeration of great information assembled by Luke here, uh, and also just contributed to by our community and the local upstate. Uh, so when you go into those resources, one of the main things that you'll get here is an actual uh, conference schedule. We snap forward a little bit. Uh, so you can see Carolina Con's already on there because they have their date, uh, but we cover all the way out, especially when we get into the B-side season uh, in the fall. With that, I want to move us into our presentation and we're graciously joined by Steve, is a director of product security at ServiceNow, but is also the chair of the Cyclone DX uh, project. So today, Steve is gonna be going over the software bill of materials um, as related to OWASP and Cyclone DX. So welcome, Steve. Very good, thanks for, thanks for having me. And thanks for the entire DC support group for, for tuning in and trying to learn a little bit more about S files and DX. So with that, uh, real quick, uh, this is me. If you want uh, some contact information, um, I do um, a couple different OWASP projects. Cyclone DX obviously be one of them. Um, OWASP dependency trap being another. Um, and like uh, like was mentioned earlier, I, I do um, product security over at Service Now. Contact information for bird site, Mesto, and email for my job. Um, this is kind of a different talk that I, that I figured I would, I would, I would do. Um, since this is a, a DC crowd, um, I'm not sure how familiar you are, you are with, with the OWASP projects. So I want to give everyone maybe a background about the OWASP projects, <coughs> and kind of how they're structured, and if you want to contribute to, to, to any of those. And then we'll dive into Cyclone DX. And the Cyclone DX part of the presentation is pretty much identical to a presentation that I gave just a few weeks ago to the DOD uh, CIO uh, panel um, on the uh, So with that, let's just 
have a quick overview of, of OWASP projects and what they are. Um, first of all, if you go to OWASP.org slash projects, there are literally, I think, 200 and some odd projects over in OWASP today. Um, and because of that, discovery can be a little, a little challenging. Um, we don't have a, a really good taxonomy of, of, here's a project that does X. And uh, so that, that's all kind of work that's, uh, that, that's ongoing. But um, anyone who participated in OWASP projects, um, OWASP um, takes vendor neutrality be seriously, uh, which means that we're not vendor, we're not anti-vendor, we just, if, you know, we, we just treat everybody the same, um, which I think is great because that kind of philosophy actually leads to that next point, which is everyone has an equal seat at the table. So regardless of whether you're a, an individual contributor that just happens to be a subject matter expert on whatever it is, or if you're a large billion dollar organization that gives financially to OWASP, you both have an equal seat at the table, which I find uh, quite refreshing. Um, and it allows you to um, to really tap into talent that you might uh, that might otherwise be uh, a notice. Um, projects are actually broken down by different types and different classifications. Uh, the types, the code project, documentation project, tool projects, and then we have um, only one standards project, which is Cyclone DX, in fact. Um, and then we have uh, project classifications, which is Builder, Breaker, and Defender. Um, so that's kind of how we're structured. The um, projects themselves have different levels of maturity. Brand new projects start at the incubation stage, um, and we have a maturity on how we can get up to that labs stage. And then that final stage is production. So these are the, the production quality uh, OWASP projects um, that, um, that have got two or more releases and a community and all these other things that production projects um, have. Once you get to that level, however, there's certain projects that have a, um, a, a strategic um, benefit, I guess, to the OWASP, a strategic importance to the OWASP Foundation itself. Things like the OWASP Top 10 is a flagship project. And what we're going to be talking about today is Second Yes, which is also a OWASP flagship project. So anyway, that's kind of how I get maturity over there. Um, I've got two OWASP projects uh, that are flagship right now, Cyclone DX, and, uh, which is the Build Material Standard, and OWASP Dependency Track, which is a uh, reference implementation for how to consume and analyze software routines. Then I also have a LABS project, which is the Software Component Verification Standard, or SCVS. And even though SCVS is a LABS project, it's actually referenced in its entirety in NIST SSDF. So when organizations want to comply to NIST SSDF, they actually are also complying to SCBS. So these smaller projects can have a tremendous amount of impact. So it's, uh, it's a really great community of folks um, coming together for the greater good of community. Um, if you have ideas for new projects, go to walls.org slash projects, identify if something exists already or is similar to the idea that you want. Um, if there is something, consider contributing to that project and implementing your idea. And of course, if nothing exists, open a JIRA ticket requesting a new project. So uh, right now, I think we have 250 or so projects. Uh, so again, discovery is, is a challenge. But check it out. Anyway, that's a quick background on, on OWASP projects anyway. And with that, let's dive into Cyclone DX. Cyclone DX is a full stack bill of materials format. Um, it's really focused on uh, software supply chain security. Um, and most of the leaders within the group are come from the security background. It is um, definitely in use. Uh, we, this statistic is from uh, January of 
last year. So I don't know if this 100,000 number is doubled or it's two and a half times. I, I honestly don't know yet. We, we need to do some estimates. estimates. Uh, however, it's, it's an interesting number because it's big enough to know that things work. If, if, if things did not work, if the standard did not work, you would have certainly heard about it. Um, but it's small enough in comparison to the millions of organizations that, that exist. So there's still a lot of growth opportunities. Um, it's, uh, like I said, uh, OAuth dependency track was that reference implementation for uh, how to analyze, consume and analyze software build materials. And dependency track, as measured by some type, is responsible for analyzing 300 million components every single month. So, the, the standard and tooling uh, is certainly getting uh, used. So, what is that? Well, it's an OWASP standards project, which we talked about. Um, it is a lightweight, yet it's full featured bill of materials format. It was designed in 2017, and it should release in 2018. We've had yearly releases since then. In fact, we're trying to push out a release. Um, Probably, probably won't hit this month, but it'll, it'll definitely be in May. Um, we have this formal governance and, and standardization process. Um, it's been adopted by multiple world governments, and we have a large industry, uh, uh, growing industry of, the, uh, of adopters and supporters. Here's the slide that talks about that. Um, design the principles. Um, Lightweight and full feature. Um, there is a lot of different things that you can describe in a building materials format. Um, so it was really important for us, especially for some of these more advanced use cases, to limit the flexibility and provide a more prescriptive way of actually accomplishing those particular things. So it's, it's really difficult to kind of shoot yourself in the foot with something like this. Um, it has a lot of guardrails kind of in place, but, which is great, because that kind of approach makes it really easy to understand, implement, and adopt. Right? You can look at and read Cyclone TX from end to end and create a 100% compliant implementation in a few days. Right? It's not hard. Um, specification does a lot. Right? There's a lot to it, but it it also goes really deep. So you can you have a gradual adoption path, whether you want to start with S bombs and move out to other use cases, or if you just want to start with some basic S bomb type um, uh, data elements and go really, really deep into S bombs, for example, you can you can do that. Um, we basically have digital signatures everywhere uh, within Cyclone DX as part of the standard. And we design with everything in mind. And when I mean everything, I'm basically saying everything. Everything from software to software as a service, IoT, mobile devices, we're very big, big in uh, healthcare and medical devices, automotive and smart cities is something that we're, we're also targeting. Lockheed Martin just happens to be a, um, a really big Cyclone DX adopter. So, yes, that is an image of an F 35. Because describing the guidance system on an F-35 is a, is a real use case for us. So we are designing for all of these different things. <coughs> um, current capabilities. Now, we've all kind of heard about SBOM, 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 SBOM. I'm so sick about hearing about SBOM. It's, uh, Cycle DX is a deal of materials um, One of the things we can do is software. But we're not limited to software. Um, I'm not a big fan of, of having a, uh, what do you call it, a domain specific bill of materials thing. I, I don't know who came up with the term SBOM. I'm not a big fan. <coughs> In the hardware world, for example, they don't call them HBOMs. Okay, that's not what they do. It's like what they support it, but you know, they don't call themselves HBOMs. And certainly within the hardware world, they don't have uh, you, they don't have different types of bill of materials for the different types of uh, parts. They don't have a plexiglass bill of material right? and a capacitor bill of material and an LED. But no, they don't, they don't have those types of bill of materials. 
right? They have building material types for the different stages of manufacturing, right? They have the carrying building material, they have the engineering building material, manufacturing building material. We're much more inclined to that type of approach because software is complex and it includes a lot more than just software, right? Software hasn't lived in a bubble in 20 years. Modern software calls out to the internet, it communicates with devices in its environment. <coughs> Um, you know, the days of having standalone embedded things that just ran on a solar device and didn't talk to anything was 20 plus years ago. Um, but we have these terms, we have to live with these terms. Um, so CycleVX supports all of these things today. So software build materials, software as a service build material, operations build materials, um, but we also support vulnerabilities as, as, as inventory. So if you want to describe like if you want to trade vulnerability information between the two or more systems, you can do that exactly with DX. It's fully capable, um, including all the evidence for reproducibility and, and all that as well. And once a vulnerability is applicable to maybe a piece of software, then that goes into vulnerability disclosure and, and, and facts. And we're going to dive into all these things in, in just a moment. But briefly, software building materials is the inventory of software components and services and their dependency relationships between these things. Now, if you talk to the U.S. government, they will exclude services. OWASP, we mean include services. Um, it's kind of silly to exclude part of your software inventory just because the uh, it's called remote versus local. Um, so our definition includes services. Um, you can describe the dependency relationships between components and other components, between components and services, and between other services and other services. Um, you can also describe things like pedigree of provenance, provenance being that origin story, right? Where did you get something from? What does that chain of custody look like? Um, if you got something from a iffy supplier, um, then that's that's interesting information to know. Likewise, if a supplier is now out of business, that's also really interesting. Um, pedigree is really about the DNA, right? Um, open source, especially, is the ultimate selection, right? Components are created, they're, they're modified, they're renamed, they're distributed at infinity. And being able to track all of those changes and those deviations from that original thing is something that CycloDX supports. Obviously, license compliance security is not the center of the universe. There are other use cases as well. So we support license compliance and, and a bunch of other things as well. Um, services in an S model kind of looks like this, right? You might actually have the inventory of components. In this particular case, I, it looks like I have a, a Java application. Got some data by, we've got a bunch of cool things in here. But uh, the AccuStack stock library, it looks like it's a shim. It's a, it's a, it's a convenience library that actually calls out to this remote service to get stock notes, right? So it looks like I'm passing um, uh, probably a secret of some kind, maybe authentication of a token, I'm pu passing public information, probably a stock ticker, and I'm getting personally identifiable financial information in return. And so you can describe all this kind of data within second things. Um, and the services, again, they just become part of the inventory, part of your dependency graph, um, and that sort of thing. But what if you were to eliminate all the software components and, and you were to describe nothing but services? Right? Well, that's also a perfectly valid use case for the sample fields. So you can describe the services, their endpoints, data flows, data classifications, um, directional flow of data. You can describe all of that in Cyclone DX today. So if you want to create a SAS bomb, um, it is architectural and fast, right? So if you want to describe a complete microservice architecture, um, anything from the actor model, so if you're running Erlang, or if you want to describe a, uh, a system of system, maybe an automobile, right, or an MRI machine in the hospital, you can, you can describe these, these types of uh, uh, systems as well. Um, the interesting thing about this is that your your software is a service to the material. It's a different kind of thing about what you care about. In the SBOM use case, the SBOM is really intended for on-prem software, for software that you have 
near you, right? Whether it's on your mobile device, whether it's on a server in your data center, it's really about um, protecting your infrastructure, your environment in which that software works. The SaaS case, well, that's somebody else's problem. What you care about typically is the data, right? I care about my data if I subscribe to you know, some vendor's SaaS service. That's what I care about. I don't have to protect my environment because they're the one who wants to get from me. But I do care about the data. So we're very, very focused in on the data side when it comes to SaaS companies and SaaS companies. Um, so this is a typical microservice architecture that you can describe as SaaS companies today. Um, you have some kind of actor, whether it's somebody in their web browser, mobile device, whatever, an API gateway, five different microservices. They all kind of talk to each other in some kind of form. Postgres database, S3 bucket. Well, you can describe all these things. And then for each one of these microservices, right, you might have something written in Python, you might have another one written in Go, maybe Java. You can do it, you can link out to their corresponding S functions. So it becomes a graph of filler materials at that point, which is a really interesting use case. Some of the things that you can do with uh, SaaS problems or just having services in, in general is, well, you kind of need to know what you have if you want to protect that thing. Um, so you, obviously for inventory purposes, you can uh, obviously reduce the attack service if you know what you have. Um, you can baseline it and use it for anomaly protection. For example, that prior diagram of my sense, uh, if I sense, you know, maybe a, a six microservice pop up. Well, that's interesting. Why? Um, if I sense maybe a different data classification going somewhere that it should have been going, well, that's interesting. Why? Um, so there's a lot of different uh, use cases that you can use for your sense for this. We also cover hardware. Um, so hardware has its own identities as well. So obviously G10 and GMS. Uh, for, these are both GS1 standards to identify different types of devices. Um, you can uh, describe just like just, you can do it in software as well, but it's very common in, in hardware devices. You can describe these assemblies, right? And assemblies think of it as a um, an exploded view, for example. You might have a dashboard, and within that dashboard, you might have an instrument panel. And within that instrument cluster, you might have a speedometer, a tachometer, and all these things. And within that speedometer component, you might have some plexiglass and LEDs, capacitors, um, that sort of thing. And you can describe that hierarchical relationship using component assemblage. You can do the same thing with software as well, but it's, just, it's, it's much more common in, in, the, in the hardware world. You can describe dependency relationships. Uh, you can describe pro uh, the quantity of these things and the problems where you got them from, from the supplier's perspective. And for hardware use cases, this is really um, this is really useful because you have things like FOSI and you know, other things that you might want to track. Where did you actually get this uh, this component from? Once you actually get software. Right? You typically would deploy it um, and that thing that you deploy it to might have hardware, right? It might have an operating system on it. It might have device drivers and maybe some, some other things. Um, that entire thing now is your effective uh, set of dependencies and, and we call that an operations going to. So, this is really the effective dependencies, the effective components being used at runtime uh, in your environment. And you can describe configurations, the deployment scenarios, and that sort of thing with, uh, with operational materials. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, you can also inventory vulnerabilities, and if you want to uh, exchange vulnerability information between different systems, perfectly valid use case. Um, and yeah, the vulnerabilities themselves, uh, you can reference other vulnerabilities. You can uh, obviously describe the severity and CBSS scores. And you can actually have multiples uh, as well, especially from different parties. So for example, if the MVD is uh, severity rating something, and then maybe a different organization is severity rating something, um, you can describe all of the different parties and their, all, all of their different CBSS scores. 
Uh, it also supports the OWASP risk rating uh, methodology as well. And then uh, in the next version of Cyclone, we're also putting in the uh, all the proof of concept stuff, so all the steps to reproducibility, uh, all the evidence, uh, so we're going to attach screenshots, payloads, uh, POC exploit code, that sort of thing. Uh, that can all uh, that will all be supported in the next release uh, next month. Um, going to those disclosure reports, um, so the ability for, in a machine-readable way, to describe the vulnerabilities that are affecting a, a, a piece of software or a service, right? Whether it's a, a, an on-prem application, whether it's some, um, you know, microservice that you've that you're, that you're using, you can describe all the both known and unknown vulnerabilities affecting. Um, this is really great for, and it exceeds all the ISO uh, 29147 requirements. Um, this is this is an interesting use case because Flightbot um, has supported this since uh, 2019. Actually, it was actually originally contributed by SunType uh, to the to the OWASP community. But one of the interesting things is that there's no really widely used machine readable um, way to you know, when, you, when you're doing a pen test engagement, and the result of that is typically a PDF or maybe an Excel spreadsheet if you're lucky, um, if you give that to the development team, they're going to throw it back at you. Right? If, you, if it's not in a defect tracker, it's not going to get fixed. So the shortest way to be able to do that is to have a machine readable way to do it, and that is basically what Second DX provides. So this is really going to be important when that next release comes out. So well, we will have all the supporting evidence and that sort of thing. So hopefully, hopefully, the days of PDFs and spreadsheets from pen test engagements will hopefully be not at this important time. Um, but we also support this thing called FETS, or Vulnerability and Exploitability Exchange. And this is basically a negative security. <coughs> the interesting thing about um, about S files is that when you provide them out to your customers, they're going to use them. <laughs> they're going to identify all the vulnerable components that you have in your application that you just sold them. And the interesting thing about that is that depending on your source of, uh, of data, um, upwards of 80%, sometimes 90%, depending on who you're listening to, uh, a large percentage of those vulnerable components are not going to be exploitable in the context of the application that they're running. Right? They're not. So that is a way to say that, hey, I have this, I have this mobile component, and is it affected against my product or not? Uh, most of the time, it's going to be not. Um, so it's it's a way to to assess a, a negative security risk. Now, you talked about you know. Software and services and, and, and vulnerabilities and, and all these different things, um, hardware, and obviously you don't want to put that all into a building material, right? You want some way to reference all of these things together, and that referencing capability is something that we call bottleneck. So anywhere that you see a basically a URL or a URI within the Cyclone DX specification. Can insert a bottle. And this basically tells you that I'm going to fetch this particular component from this particular bomb. So a bomb basically, for every for every bill of material, it has its own identity, just like software has its own identity. For every bill of material, we have a serial number and a version. Um, and then you can deep link into that. So in that example on the bottom, we're linking into component A of that particular bill of material. So that's a way that we can kind of Reference within the same bill material or reference across bill materials. But uh, like I said, we've been uh, we've been working on the next version of Second DX for a long time, and we've I mean the amount of contributors to this is just utterly staggering. Um, in addition to all the current capabilities that we have today, um, we are adding support for machine learning bill material. We are adding support for manufacturing bill of material, and we are really, really hopeful to add support for bill of attestations as well. So, what are these things? So, MLcoms 
um, are basically an inventory of your models and your data sets and that sort of thing. And what we've done is we've standardized the model parts used within the AI industry. Um, and we've done so in a way that is independent of the AML framework. Now, model parts, for those who don't know, what well, I think we came out of a research paper, Google picked it up, and it's kind of become the industry norm. It's a way to describe things like the architecture of the model. Where did you get the data from? What are the uses? What are the limitations? What are the ethical considerations, right? It's all kind of represented in the model. Um, so we're describing things like performance metrics, and uses and limitations, and fairness assessments. So we, we're capturing all that data in a machine-readable way, which is phenomenal. Um, dependency relationships as well, obviously pedigree and provenance. Where did that data set come from? A really interesting question. Uh, I've talked to folks over at the Pentagon, for example, and they are really, really interested in having provenance of uh, both models and the data sets. Um, the interesting thing is that you have nation state adversaries that are creating um, essentially models that compete with existing models and offer basically the same type of capabilities, yet it might have a few more thing, a few more bells and whistles, so to speak, uh, to entice people to, to use that new model, right? When in reality, it's actually been tainted with data that that nation state adversary has predicted that you know, will work, work in certain situations. So having that providence, having that pedigree is very, very important. Um, not just for like the DOD type of stuff that I was talking about, but for healthcare, for you know uh, financial services. There's a lot of reasons why why, why this is important. Um, manufacturing protocols. This is also coming to Cycle DX. Uh, this is a way to describe the formulation, how something how something was created. Um, what we're doing is we're supporting both the declared and observed formulas. The declared formula is like the recipe, right? This is what I wrote down and what I should have done. The observed is what I actually did in the kitchen, right? This is how the this is how the sausage was actually made. Um, were they the same? Did they vary? Did those variances actually make any difference? I don't know. It's good information to have. Uh, the formulas basically are broken down into workflows, steps, uh, tasks, etc. And if you want to describe true reproducibility, right? You're building software. Um, reproducible build is a concept where you basically uh, run the same build and you get the same hash, right? You get the same you know, resulting checksum at the end. Um, that's not most people's definition of reproducibility because there's so many other environmental aspects that are also important. For example, if you're getting your components from one place, and the next build, you're getting your components from another place, yeah, your hash might match, but guess what? You just got your components from a nation state, you got your components from a repository controlled by an adversary, and the next time you update one of those components, they own it. So having all of that information is, is really, really important. So we're, we're, we're supporting this in the, in the next release of cycle as well. Then we've got the stations. Um, I was really surprised that um, a machine readable way to attest to something, um, it doesn't exist. Um, there's certainly industry specific things. Um, there are uh, human readable things, Word docs and PDFs all over the A scalable, machine readable way to attest to different things. So we're adding support for this in Cyclone DX. Um, and what this is going to allow us to do is like if your organization requires you know, SOC 2 compliance or um, you know, you need to comply to SSDF for whatever reason, or maybe you're, you're getting your application uh, assessed uh, for OWASP, the application security verification standard, right? Um, so this is a way to kind of share those attestations with whoever uh, whoever needs to know. Uh, all the attestations uh, provide the, the, the 
support for the standards, right? All the claims, all the evidence supporting those claims, the reason why that evidence supports those claims, and it supports partial compliance as well, right? So, you know, the world isn't black and white. Sometimes you might be partially ready for compliance on a particular claim, but you're not quite there. And being able to describe that mitigation strategy and your roadmap to compliance is, is, is also going to be supported. So that's currently what's what's coming. But we're not done. Um, there's, there's, like I said, there's been a tremendous amount of contributions in Cycling DX. One of those contributions uh, has come from IDEA. And what they've done, they've got some researchers in Zurich that have created something called photography build materials. And what this is, is a way to identify all the different cryptographic assets and their parameters, such as the algorithms, search protocols, pretty much anything, and assess them so that you can prepare yourself, you can prepare yourself out, your organization for a quantum safe system and applications. Um, really interesting research done by IBM. They basically forked uh, Cycle DX 1.4. And we are currently working with them. We want to upstream those changes into the uh, 1.6. So 1.5 is the next one that's going to be coming uh, next month. And then 1.6, that will contain the cryptography of the materials that, just, you know, that, that we're talking about here. So we are, we are, we are excited about this one. This is, this is going to be huge for us. Um, and there's so many different, at this point, between the, the ML um, the uh, formulation and the cryptography, pretty much every world government at, at this point is going to be wanting to use CycleDX. Um, so you put it all together, and this is kind of what we have today. Um, it's an easy on ramp to adoption, it grows with the needs of the world. Um, like I said, you can start small, you can expand over time. Have uh, about 100 and it's just under 190 tools now that actually support CycloDX, both open source and commercial. So it's, it is the largest collection of tools right now that actually uh, support any uh, SBOM standard. Um, led by industry folks, um, you know, myself, but there's, there's certainly other folks within the security community that are leaders in their, their own respective rights. Um, and we have a very Slack community. So OWASP.org. Um, uh, I'm sorry, that's cyclonedx.org slash slot, slash invite. But um, yeah, we're still not done. One of the things that building material is good for is inventory. Great. But as a defender, which is really what the inventory is for, right? This is, this is all about transparency. And the reason why transparency is is, uh, is 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 demanded by the U.S. federal government and governments around the world is so that organizations can defend themselves. Having an inventory, start knowing how the application works. That's much better. That's what we're trying to get to with the architectural building materials. So at this point, we want to describe the entry and exit points of the application. We want to describe these things that we're calling blueprints. Now, this is not a complete stack trace. This is basically a way to describe, hey, the application uh, receives input. It does input validation. And it does something else, right? It's these more higher level abstract concepts that we are calling blueprints. That way, as a defender, you actually know what this application does. Um, it's also going to help us describe the reachability of that dependency graph, right? As I mentioned, most components used in an application are not necessarily uh, going to be exploitable in the context of that app. So um, we're working really hard on trying to represent reachability in the dependency graph and that'll be part of the architectural building materials as well. So um, with that, here is kind of a high level diagram, I guess, of the current version of Cyclone. Uh, this is going to be expanded out even further uh, next month. Um, kind of all the different things that we can represent today. We have a capabilities site uh, uh, 
page on the website that kind of talks about all of these different things that I mentioned, as bomb SAS bomb effects, PDRs, all these things. Um, here's the use cases. So if you want to dive in and say, hey, I want to know about maybe authenticity, what do you support there? Or let me, let me truly understand what pedigree is all about, right? You can go into the use cases and examples page and they'll have uh, a short little paragraph on what it is and you'll have examples in both JSON and XML. The XML ones are, in my opinion, are easier to read because many of them actually have comments, uh, whereas the JSON examples do not. Uh, but examples for both are provided. Um, tool Center, uh, like I said, I think the Tool Center has about 190, 180 something tools right now. Um, so if you're looking for tools, that's where to go. Um, and if you want to get involved, maybe learn more about the project, what we're doing, where we're going, uh, or maybe you're excited about it and you want to chip in, um, these are all the um, resources necessary to do that. Um, so with that, thank you, DC and System 4, for, for inviting me and, um, and for listening to me for the last 40 minutes or so. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, we have a question here. You might want to come forward for one moment. Right. Yep. So I'm currently working with an organization that is uh, dealing with a lot of enterprise security questionnaires. These really tedious forms that take hours and hours of a salesperson's time to go through and basically qualify all this stuff if you don't already have a security certification in place where you can't just easily turn over a SOC 2 report. Is there some part of Cyclone DX uh, that would make it that is accessible enough to someone you know, in, in a sales field or a business development type field where they could, as they're going through and filling these things out, go through and you know, look up, you know, what are your types of our, uh, what are your uh, encryption algorithms that you have in different parts of the application to fill that stuff out so that they don't have to escalate it to the IT department to get every one of these forms filled out? It's a common use case I've seen across a lot of organizations yeah. dealing with enterprise sales. Uh, yeah, I, I hear you. I've seen many of those spreadsheets myself. Mm -hmm. um, yes and no. So um, with the bill of attestations, that is going to allow um, third parties and, and your, your own organization to communicate uh, things like SOC 2, right? Um, ISO 27001. Um, ASVS or applications, uh, SSDF. Uh, so you can you can do all those for like different types of standards or requirements, right? Um, once the once the next version of Cyclone, we're hoping it'll be the next version of Cyclone. We actually have a working group uh, that's doing it now. Uh, once that's kind of ratified, what we plan to do with the Bill of Attestations is one, we're going to include it in Cyclone, but two, we're also going to make it independent, right? Because this is going to be truly valuable in and of itself. But for the orgs that have already adopted Cyclone, um, you're going to get that for free. Um, once the spec actually supports it, then it's a matter of the industry creating tools. Uh, to support that as well. And that, I think, um, you know, whether you, you have like a, a, a low code platform like a Salesforce or a Snell, that type of thing, you can pretty easily write these types of apps uh, for your environment. Now, one thing that it's not going to do, right, like I said, this is really designed to support the standards and uh, those types of requirements. What it doesn't do is, is it's not going to really be useful, too useful in a way, to support those types of ad hoc questionnaires, those um, um, informal questionnaires, because they're not tied to any type of regulatory or standards process, right? Um, so it's not necessarily going to help for those cases, but it certainly will help for the kind of regulatory or uh, compliance standard that we need to describe. Thank you. Hey, quick. Quick follow up on that: is, is the attestation like a self attestation, or are you looking long term for the vendors like the big threes or whoever, big fives, whoever's going to be doing your audit, your SOC twos, to provide that to you? Yeah, we're, we're describing the format. 
at describing how it's used. Okay. So if you want to self uh, self test, like um, what is going to be required for major federal government customers, um, or you know suppliers to the federal government that have to self test, um, then that will be possible. Uh, versus you know maybe you get a SOC too. Well, obviously that third party, if they so chose, could you know uh, could use Cyclone DX to provide a machine readable attestation for that. So. Okay, yeah, we're just describing the format and describing how it should be used. So, first time I heard SBOM actually came out of the uh, ICS OT space, and I thought it was just another OT acronym I didn't didn't know of. <laughs> and then when I figured it out, I was like, oh, okay, this makes sense from the IT side. Um, in the ICS OT world, do you see clients using it as their uh, asset inventory for their asset register? Yeah, so the great, no, great question. So, um, one, uh, with Cyclone, you can you can specify, like if, you, if you have a piece of hardware, right, you can specify the GTO, you can specify the, the GMF. So, um, like it, all medical devices, for example, sold in Europe actually have to have a GMF. Uh, the G10 is typically like the UPC label on, you know, so you Flip over the back of your router. There's a you know, UPC label. That's that's G10. Usually, um, what we have, uh, what OLAS, not OLAS specifically, but we, we have this group called the SBOM Forum, and uh, what we put together is a um, is a paper uh, targeting the NVD. And the problem with the NVD, well, there's there's lots of problems, and I could go on for days about problems with the NVD, but one of the most obvious problems is that they use CPEs, and CPEs are not native to the hardware industry, and they're not native to the software industry. It's something that you know somebody at MITRE or the uh, NVD folks made up and expected everybody to use it. Guess what? They don't. And we're not going to. Hardware is never going to use it. Software is never going to use it. The only folks that do is the NVD. So what we've actually recommended is that they adopt the formats that the rest of the world actually use. So we recommended that they adopt package URL, which actually is used by like millions and millions of, 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 of packages. Um, it's native to the way you develop software, right? If you write a package in Java or NPM or you know, whatever, you automatically have a package URL. I don't have to create a CPE. Um, Likewise, if I have a device, I typically am going to register that device and have a G tag. Um, it would be great if the NVD would allow me to, you know, go back to the back of my router and you know, scan the serial number and get a bunch of vulnerabilities on it. Um, that's essentially the use case that we are recommending. Um, but right now, you can't do that because you have to figure out that vendor uh, and that product correlation in the CPU dictionary. Uh, so unfortunately, the only way that for at least IT LC hardware devices that you can do it today is you have to supply the CPE in a cycling DS bill material. But we're pushing the we're pushing the uh, the miter and the NVD folks pretty hard. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Okay, I appreciate that. All right, thanks. Yeah, and good luck with that. So, all right, thank you. Well, Steve, I think that uh, that covers the questions from the, the room. We've got a nice audience in here, which uh, we had a camera so you can see it. And uh, we appreciate this talk. Uh, it's great. I think I'm personally going to be researching it a little bit myself to see where I can apply it in some of my development work. Very good. Well, uh, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, forward to reach me. Cheers. 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 Cheers.